Hey guys, it's Rick and Sharon, part two. Rick is going to talk about the construction of my cargo trailer conversion. Check it out. I wanted to get into a little bit of the actual construction specifics for people that had questions. In the past few months, we've already posted a number of videos about my camper build from a cargo trailer converting over to an actual camper. It's unfortunate at the time that we did this conversion, we didn't even have an idea or an inkling to do a YouTube channel with it. Didn't ever think about just how much interest there may be from those people who are also considering doing it. So I apologize for the fact that I don't have a lot of photographs or videos from the build. But today, at Sharon's request, I'm going to go over some things that I did that are kind of different with regard to the construction of this trailer so that uh, it may give some people ideas on how to handle what they see as things that are problematic, if you will. One of the interesting things about this trailer is that the nose wall of the trailer is curved and there, as you can see from the corner fiberglass panels, there's a curve there. There's actually a three inch radius on the outside in the sheet metal. And as a result of that, and the fact that the door on this trailer is where it is, so close to the countertop, it called for a couple solutions to deal with this. One of which is the fact that this wall behind the cabinets is a straight wall. And that wall I actually built in order for the countertop to be straight. And I didn't really want to build the curvature of the trailer into my finished product. So what I did was I built a false wall. But that false wall only goes down to just above the cabinets where they're sitting and it's straight. Now what this did was the wall has about a three inch curve to it. So it allowed me to take this base cabinet when I set it and slide it under the wall back in about three inches. As a result, my countertops are not as wide as they are in a standard home. They're only about 22 inches as opposed to, you know, the 25 and a half in a conventional home. And then because of the curvature of the wall, I actually framed it so that the studs in the middle are actually about three inches off the existing wall and they taper down to nothing on the sides. And I'm about to show you underneath so that you can get an idea. If you look in the back, you'll notice that there's a strip of wood all the way at the back in front of the wall that goes from uh, about three inches to nothing and so that whole wall is built that way the studs are uh, cut a different thickness and this cabinet because of that being set back and the fact that there's a corner here I ended up just taking the back off of it and then having to cut the side wall off about three inches which allowed me to keep this cabinet in line with or the other cabinet to the middle so that was a way to pick up three inches of space without really sacrificing the functionality of the cabinets or butchering them up too terribly bad. Now the refrigerator itself is a little shallower, but it right now is pretty much pushed back to the wall as far as it'll go. And it actually kind of hangs out a little bit past the cabinet and, and just a hair into the door opening, but I didn't consider that to be that much of a problem. In case you haven't seen our videos before, this thing with the two C-clamps is just a piece of plywood with a couple notches for the microwave feet that keeps the microwave from moving around when it's being transported. Also, I put a strip of wood on the floor down in front of the refrigerator and that holds the feet so that the refrigerator can't slide out, but yet there's enough clearance that if I needed to pull the refrigerator out, I can lift it up tip it a little bit to get it to go over top of the strip on the floor and then I can remove the refrigerator if I need to. I mentioned before in my videos that I was able to, even after seven years of construction, I hadn't beat the trailer up too badly inside. So I was able to reuse all of the existing plywood on the walls and one of my 
reasons to go that route was before I converted this trailer, it never smelled musty and I never had an issue with it leaking water anywhere. So I merely took the plywood off the walls, went ahead and insulated everything with three quarter inch styrofoam and then put the plywood back on. Then doing the window openings while I had the plywood off, I had to cut a stud out at the center of the window because these windows are 30 inches. They just barely fit between two studs. In, in fact, they actually didn't fit between two studs. The wall studs in these walls are one inch deep and it's like a Z track. It has a flange on the, like the left side on the outside for the skin to attach to. Then you got a, a flange that gives you the depth of one inch and then another flange that veers off to the right and they attach the interior plywood to that. I actually had to take a diamond grinder and grind about a quarter inch off of the stud in order to get these windows to fit into that opening. I also used that diamond grinder in the middle and cut the stud out in the middle. But when I did, I left the flange that faces the interior on and left the flange on the outside and just basically created a notch. And I dropped a piece of wood into that notch that I cut to fit the two studs on the sides and then merely screwed through those studs to hold that piece of wood in place and screwed the flange that I left intact on the middle stud into the piece of wood. I didn't have a welder to go buy a piece of steel and, and weld a header and a sill in, so I merely used wood, plus the wood uh, gave me an easy attachment for the screws when I was putting the window in. This is a quick sketch to try to explain better how I did the header and the sill for the windows. This is looking down into the wall. These are the wall studs that are a Z-shaped track. I cut off the stud in the middle at the height that I wanted the top of the wood to be at. This is talking about the sill now. So. I cut the stud off at the top and then notched the middle portion out so the wood would slip down in between the inner and the outer flanges. This is a section of the stud looking vertically. I notch out this middle section and then I can drop a piece of wood down in there and still be able to attach it from the front and, and have it rest against the back. So it's trapped in the stud and keeps the wall rigid that stud can't move in either direction off of it the walls in, in this trailer i used frp one i didn't want to get involved in a lot of painting and repainting over the the years that i would be using this so i use this fiberglass reinforcement uh, reinforced panels and they are around or were at the time around $29.85 a sheet and the moldings are only about two to three dollars a piece for an eight foot molding. So overall I think it took me maybe five sheets to do the entire interior of the trailer and I still had a part of a sheet left that I put in the back to act as a backsplash behind the kitchen. So for under $200, I was able to fully finish the walls in here and not have to worry about repainting at some point in the future. I have certain regrets, one of which I think I, I should have put more lighting in the main thing I have some regrets about because I'd like to do more with the electrical in there, like cigarette lighter type outlets inside the trailer to plug devices in that you would normally plug into your vehicle. I'd also like to have had more outlets in there than what I put in. I didn't really initially think that I was going to have a need for so many outlets. Are you happy with how it's held up? Any issues? Very happy with the way that it's held up. I did have one minor problem on one of our camping trips and that was we were on a camping trip where it rained really hard and the way that we were parked and the way the roof on this camper is set up it must have been slightly pitched to one side. The water was just cascading off the side of the roof and running down on one of these side windows and the window was actually leaking inside the the camper a little bit. Well, here after that evening when, when the rain subsided, I went out and looked. There are little weep holes on the outside of these windows 
and they made these windows that you could put them in right side up or upside down. You had weep holes at both the top and the bottom. None of those plugs were ever pulled out of there and that's why water was coming down the window and building up in the track and it wasn't able to drain out so filling the track up and draining inside. So after that I went out and I popped the plugs out of the bottom and I haven't had trouble with it since. And luckily it didn't leak long enough to get water down the wall and get things moldy and whatnot. So I was grateful there. But I mean, so far, one of the things that a lot of people have problems with in a camper is one that's sitting and it's sitting empty and it doesn't have heat in it. And then, then you go in it and you start to warm it up. It starts to have a musty smell to it. Nothing like that in here. So, so I know you guys like to tour videos, so I'm going to keep them coming. This video is not actually our video, but we were interviewed by New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. And if you want to check out that video, it's right up here. Okay, hopefully you liked that video. Let us know in the comments what you think. The next video is going to be a more in-depth video of the outdoor kitchen. And we're in the shower.